Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. And we can see it full screen now, Victor. Thanks. So I'll be quite uh, short in the, the presentation and leave more for questions and discussions at the end. So uh, the idea is to about composting in seed scales and some experiences in Brazil that we have. Uh, we are quite uh, starting our experiences. Most of our experiences here in large scale, they rely on commercial and private sector. So we are now going forward to, to address organic waste, to domestic waste, to municipal waste to mostly. And to start, it's important to, to address what is composting because we have quite a different uh, definitions around the world. And now we are starting to have a consensus. We have uh, after composting was used like an aerobic composting and it's quite used around the world an aerobic composting but uh, we understand academically scientifically that composting is a process of aer aerobic stabilization of organic waste and the anaerobic one is an aerobic digestion that might be addressed in other lectures around the, the these meetings so when we talk about composting we have some uh, technical definitions below is the Brazilian one and upwards it's an academic one from Epstein. So basically the conditions for composting to be adequate, they are aerobic in presence of air. Basically it's uh, oxygen decomposition uh, environment. So we do not produce methane in composting just in trace uh, uh, concentrations, not not viable to collect the methane. And the idea is to not produce methane as we don't have collection, right? And it's a biological process. So we don't use like a uh, thermal process, burning the stuff or drying just in some cases, but the process is mainly biological by fungus and microbes that act to stabilize the organic matter. It's controlled different from just leaving the organic waste decomposing so somewhere it's not necessarily in composting composting you need to control the process to adequate conditions and the end product should be stable that's a problem an important point because sometimes we have a composting process that do not produce stable products so they are not composting they are just a phase of composting so composting it's quite important because it closes the loop of organic waste with the anaerobic digestion and other uh, technologies as black soldier fly, animal feeding, and return mostly the organic matter and nutrients to soil. And how to do the composting process before entering the, uh, the experiences here in Brazil. Basically, you should, uh, you should regulate some parameters so the organic matters can stabilize in adequate matter, odorless, mostly, and have a stable product of a high quality. Basically, you control the carbon nitrogen ratio, the temperature in the process. Normally, in tropical countries, you don't have problems regulating the temperature of low temperatures, as in Europe and North America, and in cold uh, in cold stations, also in the global south. Like in Brazil, we don't have problems co uh, controlling the temperature. Actually, temperature gets so high in composting piles here that we normally need to, to, to decrease the temperature with water and with turnings, but naturally increases the temperature if you control adequately the moisture, the oxygen, pH, particle size. And most of all, you cannot compost organic waste, especially nitrogen rich organic waste as food waste, we felt some inputs to regulate this parameter and the density and carbon nitrogen ratio. So composting is a process that you mix nitrogen rich material with carbon rich material as wood chips, rice rucks, sawdust, leaves and grasses. So you always need this mix of two elements to have a good composting. And basically to do composting, we have an enormity of numbers of composting methods from simple ones to more complex ones. And always, if you have, a, as this complexity increases uh, toward right in the slides, the costs also increase. Basically we have like static composting piles that might be like this, 
or some adapted normally in community composting like this in pallets. We have turned windrow systems that you have a, the system that turns the window, it's more mechanical, like this also. We have forced duration that you have blowers that put the oxygen inside the, the, the pile. And this is a static one that you don't turn. You have other benefits than the turned. Sometimes you have the static aerated pile with covers like this. So you don't have the exposed environment here. Uh, and gas, gas trades with the environment, you have the cover and also reactors, basically. Just to give a big picture to enter. So basically what you do to think about composting, we don't have one composting method for the whole world for the same cities that cities that are beside other in the same country, because you choose the composting method adequate to your own scenario. It depends on the availability of area, the inputs, the characteristics of waste that you put, the labor and equipment that you have, the location, if it's intra-urban, peri-urban, rural area, and also what is the compost use that you want. So uh, because the area that you use for composting, it varies a lot depending on the method you choose from 80 meters per ton per day to 200 meters square meters per ton per day, depending on the, the system. Normally, the most complex systems, they use less area than the, the most cheap ones that are the static piles. And the compost quality and production that you will have, basically, it's important benefit of composting because the mass reduction of composting, everything that you put, depending on the carbon composition mostly, and uh, you will have around 30 to 50% of the mass input as an output of compost. So if you have one ton, you will produce around 300, 500 kilos of compost. And basically the quality of the compost, it's highly dependent on source separation. If you don't have a good source separation, you might have problems of heavy metals in your compost. We have some standards uh, road widely different in North America, Europe, Brazil, and other pla other places, and good composting operations to keep temperature high and sanitize, hygienize the process, and do not have biological pathogens in the process. Here are basically the limits that we have in Brazil. And the right, uh, sorry, it's in Portuguese, but uh, it's the basically heavy metal uh, contaminants limitations and also the biological contaminants like uh, uh, coliforms, uh, salmonella and others, and inert materials also like glass, plastic and metals and uh, stones in the, in the compost that you have limitations. And in the left side, the quality of minimum nitrogen uh, concentration. You have uh, several ones around the world. So, and what we do in the main experiences that we know here in Brazil, Sao Paulo is a one that uh, uh, push forward composting in Brazil. Basically, we have composting of public affairs here in the city. It's the city that I live. And public affairs here in Brazil generates uh, average of one ton of organic waste per day, varying from 300 kilos to two tons. We have uh, 900 public fairs here in Sao Paulo only each week, like 150 every day in the city. And the city now have five composting units, each one with 10 tons of capacity of organic waste per day. And they receive the waste from the street fairs and also tree pruning. This is the, a view of a composting unit that we have here that operate manually. It's semi-mechanical. Part is manually, part is mechanical with a small loader. The, they receive waste in this moment from public markets and public fair. It's quite a low percentage of the whole city organic waste generation. We generate around 5,000 tons of 6,000 tons of organic waste and we compost only 50 tons per day. 
And we have organic collection of the organic waste, basically with, with common trucks of organic co of, of waste collection in the city that are separated to the organic ones. This is how uh, the composting unit looks like in this project. Most of the, the units works in the passively aerated static piles. It's a composting plant that uh, has a, a composting method that works for intra-urban areas. So we have like this, it's a composting plant besides a school, a primary school here, a public one. It's basically an engine method called indoor method that was uh, some way adapted here by university in Brazil. The municipality contracts a company that do the waste management to manage also the composting plants so they don't don't transport this waste to a landfill that is five five uh, it's 50 kilometers from the city and the composting plants are inside the city so they basically save money with diesel and we have like uh, 1,500 square meters for each composting unit, and it's operated by two people plus a small loader half, uh, half the day. And we use a, a mix of fruit, vegetables, tree pruning, and grass, more straw grass and straw to cover. Fruit, vegetables mixed with tree pruning in a volume ratio of 111. In mass ratio, it's 10.3.0.3. Florianópolis is a municipality here also that is advancing with uh, domestic waste. They collected 20 tons per day separately. The municipality also have high costs with common waste management because they are at Iceland. So they passed the zero waste law in 2019 and they are piloting se separate collection here. They started mostly with houses and condominiums here of high income, middle high income neighborhoods. They receive the compostable bags to collect the organic waste. And also these condominiums needed to buy European containers to do the separate collection. The collection is done two times a week, the organic waste and the refuse one time a week. So they have this uh, adapted European collection trucks that you put the, the container here and they put for all upwards and put in the, the truck. And in more poor communities that uh, they don't, don't, don't buy the, the containers, they have this bringing points with this, this blue drones of like 50 liters that the community put the waste in these drones and uh, they transport in adapted the trucks in the city. So they are collecting now. 20 tons per day. And another project that we have here that's quite interesting to share, it's a small municipality in South Brazil. They developed this green coin project that we call Pila Verde here. And the municipality has uh, had a uh, high cost. We forget, with waste management, the waste traveled like maybe 100 kilometers. And they had like uh, 50, uh, 500 reais, that it's our, our, our money here, per ton of waste. And local farmers use it to pay like 30 reais per ton of compost. So the municipality developed a project that it was a green social coin that municipality buys five kilos of organic waste separately at source by one reais. And then the municipality compost this waste. The farmer that wants this compost, the, then he receives the compost, but he needs this green coin that he exchange from his production in the public fairs in the city. So the, the citizen, the, they deliver the organic waste, the municipality pays an amount of money of this organic waste. He gives it uh, to a farmer in a public affair, this, this green coin, and the farmer with this green coin can buy the compost from the, the city. And here at the right, you have the, the truck delivering the ready compost to farmers. 
So these are the main three uh, kind of projects that we have here that it's the domestic one, municipal one that is focused on public first, but the organic domestic waste, we are still advancing in the collection as we have a higher cost to separate collect and you need to have a more public awareness, but we are trying to adapt to this green coin possibilities, bring the in points that are cheaper to smaller municipalities mostly. I guess it's it's what I had to share with you all, and feel free to ask your questions. We can discuss in the end. No, thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Such a wonderful way to start because you gave us some good information just on composting, the methods, the different approaches, and then what you're doing in Sao Paulo is just so incredible. And the green coin, um, I think that's really an innovation and I'm sure there'll be some more questions um, at the end around that as well. So thank you so much for Victor and thank you for keeping to time as well. So we're not gonna take questions now, we'll move on to the next presentation and then we'll take some questions at the end. So I'm gonna introduce our, our second wonderful presenter, Anna La Rocha. Um, she is the executive director of Nepofagio based in Tanzania. She holds a master's degree in business with a focus on business strategy and sustainability and marketing. And she has over 15 years in community engagement. Anna has lived in rural Tanzania for seven years, catalyzing income security for local communities through various social entrepreneurism programs. So thanks, Anna. She's going to be talking to us today about her different projects that um, will help us think about how we can divert organic waste. Thank you, Anna. OK, here you go. Can you see my screen properly? Yeah, perfect. And we can hear you great. Thanks. OK, so thank you, everyone. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about composting in the zero waste model that we have going on here in Tanzania. Um, it's more composting at the community um, scale. So it's like we do it per neighborhood. So we manage the waste of the neighborhood. And I apologize that I have a bad cough. So if I start coughing in the middle of the presentation, I apologize in advance. So I'll, talk, I'll start talking a little bit about the zero waste model itself so people have an idea about what that is. So it's basic, basically a model that aligns people and planets. So we are proposing a solution that has social outcomes as well as environmental benefits. Uh, it's decentralized. So that's why we are doing this at the, the community level. So it's basically a decentralization of waste management. And it's also awareness building in the sense that people get to understand that not all kinds of waste are the same, that, for example, organic waste is not the same as plastic waste. Um, it does have quite high relevance here, especially when you think about composting again. So there is a greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, an inventory that was done in Dar es Salaam by C40. And one of the things that um, became clear is that waste, solid waste is basically um, the main contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions in Dar es Salaam. And that comes a lot from, that is, there are two, there are two components. So basically that we have an issue with lack of proper uh, sewage, but we also have an issue with leakage in, um, in, waste, in waste management in general. And so it's quite relevant for us to address organic waste, methane, and all of that. And considering that about 75% of all the waste that we collect is organic, <coughs> sorry, again, um, it's extremely important for us to address organic waste, like this graph that shows that if, if food wastage uh, were a country, it would be the third largest emitting country in the world. Um, only behind China and the US. So that is how large um, we need to think about, how, how intensive you need to think about organic waste management and food waste management. So how does the zero waste model work? It's basically a cooperative led model. We have former waste speakers, we have women, we have mostly youth from the community that then form a cooperative and it starts working together. And what they do is that they go to the households 
to then collect waste from the household. And one um, requirement is basically that the household needs to do segregation at source. So the households are segregating the waste into four groups, uh, organic waste, recyclable waste, hazardous waste, and residual waste at every household. Um, they have received training on how to do that and they do that separation. And then that is collected by the waste cooperative that then takes it to the material recovery facility. It's a local material uh, recovery facility just for that. Um, once waste reaches the material recovery facility, then it gets segregated further. Um, so there are several different kinds of composting that we are doing. There are the is a segregation of the different kinds of recyclable materials as well. So everything is stored there. Um, and then all the composting is handled locally, um, all the recyclables on, and the residue is then transported to the official, they don't have a landfill in Dar es Salaam, so to the official um, dump site. So one of the things is like when people are that's something that I really believe and I like to repeat it in every presentation with people. Um, I think one of the things that this model shows is that when people are given a good choice, they take it. So in low income communities of Dar es Salaam, um, we have been able to engage more than 32,000 people. Um, we have generated 33 more times in one neighborhood than the entire city, uh, city provides two waste management. We have had the reduction of 75% of all the waste to dump sites. And that is actually higher now, it's at about 82%. Um, we have used less than 15% of the annual projected budget um, for that particular neighborhood, neighborhood to be able to do that. And the most important thing is that we have 93% compliance to segregation at source. So what that means is that people are there segregating their waste, doing things properly so that the model can work. So these are a couple of pictures for you to see how that looks like. So this is the material recovery facility that is built in one of our communities in Bonioqua. Um, it's a quite large facility. It has places for, for us to store all the recyclables, um, handle all the organic waste, store the residual waste as well, because you only have a truck collecting that every two weeks. Um, from the inside, that's how it looks like. We have composting chambers. And these are the recyclables storage facility. Um, this is the cooperative members. So these are the waste um, collectors. They go to every household. They use hand cards. They collect all the waste, the segregated waste. Then they bring it to the material recovery facility. Everything is properly weighted. Um, um, we have proper records keeping on everything that is coming and everything. And these are some pictures that show basically the plastic weight management on the left on the top, uh, vermicomposting in the middle, black soldier flies on the right top. Um, some of the residual waste, these black bottles um, on the bottom right, the waste cooperative members and the, and the cards that they use to do the collection. So how does the organic waste collection work? So basically we have a monthly average of about 29,000 kilos, so 29 tons of uh, organic waste being uh, taken from the households. The average daily collection depends because we have um, about 22 to 23 working days we don't collect waste on weekends. Um, and so that, that daily average is very, um, for example, Mondays are higher because you don't collect on Saturdays and Sundays and things like that. Uh, the households put the organic waste in 10 liter buckets that have been distributed to them specifically to store kitchen waste. And then the waste, collect the waste collectors, uh, they collect the organic waste on weekdays and they take it to the material recovery facility for processing. We have several different kinds of composting. I am far from being a specialist or an expert on what we have been learning as we go, um, as we manage. And we have been trying several different things to be able to learn the most of it as well. And so we have thermophilic composting and we use wooden pallets to do that. Um, we use piles of collected waste from the households and we balance it with materials that are rich in carbon. The proportion being 
about 60% carbon and 40% nitrogen. It takes about 30 days for us to harvest that compost. And so basically we, we mix the kitchen um, materials with sawdust, with leaves, with green leaves, with dried leaves, um, even with um, powder from, um, from firewood that people use or from charcoal that people use. And things like that. We have mesophilic composting and we use beans for that. So on those, the waste, um, the waste is placed in the beans and we don't actually mix it. The thermophilic compost, we actually mix it several times, but the mesophilic compost, we don't. So this waste just stays there until it all turns black. And then we harvest it um, through an outlet that is on the bottom of the bean. So here you can have pictures of So based on the left side, you can see the thermophilic compost in the wooden pallets, and then on the right side, the bean composting. Um, and you see that the beans, they have holes in it. So basically all the leakage comes out. We also produce black soldier flies. So we use household waste to raise black soldier flies. Um, we have a structure that was designed by a company that um, is basically, they, are, um, they do a technical, um, design uh, for the black soldier fly um, production and collection of maggots. Um, and these maggots, they are rich in protein for chickens and fish. So people are very excited about it. It's a very good byproduct from, from the model. Uh, we produce up to 20 kilos of dried maggots per month. So after they, they, um, we harvest them, we dry them, and then people can use it to feed um, So this is a little bit how the um, black soldier fly um, structure looks like. Several of them, they are actually quite easy to read. They all come on <laughs> to, the, to the facility um, and they, are, they, they grow quite well. We also do some vermicomposting. So we use partially composted materials from the thermophilic composting to feed the worms. We also add some paper and cardboard that has been um, soaked in water um, to it. And then we have the worms that we have been raising. The neighbors quickly buy the vermicomposting because they believe it's higher in quality compared to the thermophilic composting. And it takes about 60 days for us, um, for that compost to be ready. Um, we have also now installed this, it's like a bath tube. It's like an old bath tube um, where we can also keep the worms and then we keep it lifted from the ground so that the leakage can come out. And we do organic farming. So one of the, another byproducts from all this compost that has been um, produced is that we started organic far, uh, farming. And so we hit about nearly half of the compost produced in the zero waste model is actually being used to cultivate vegetables there is a plot that is right behind the material recovery facility. And that plot is managed by the waste cooperative members. So we raise different kinds of greens, like tempo, like tembele is a green here in Tanzania, pumpkin, spinach, okra, so different kinds of vegetables. And the community members have really high interest in the vegetables because they are chemical free. So it's organic farming. And it's also not cultivated with dirty water. Um, frequently in Dar es Salaam, People cultivate um, vegetables close to the rivers and the rivers are dirty. So, so these are a couple of pictures about uh, the organic farming. So that's my short presentation. I apologize about the coffee. Um, as Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, that was brilliant. Thanks so much for that. Um, a lot of interesting innovation that you, you, you're doing there. I mean, the stats that you were showing were just phenomenal um, to get that sort of buy-in from communities, to get that um, commitment to separation at source. And you're trying so many different approaches there. So hats off to you and thank you so much. I'm sure there's gonna be questions around um, some of that as well. 
So thanks to Anna. So let me just quickly introduce our third um, presenter, Alok Gogat. Am I pronouncing your surname correctly, Alok? Yes, Alok Gokte. Uh, That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Alok. Alok is currently leading operations at Swatch Pune, the Swatch Pune Cooperative. He's a civil engineer and an urban planner by profession, specializing in environmental planning. He has more than five years experience in consulting at a city level and at a state level for the Swash Bharat mission. And in his current capacity, he's working with Swash to improve the working conditions of waste pickers in Pune, India, creating a better awareness, better engagement platforms um, and developing better waste management functions for implementing the three R principle at a city scale. So thank you, Alok, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, we can yeah. see it. If you want to just put it in um, yes. the big mode. Yes. Hello, all. So, there we go. Uh, hello, all. So, it's, it's good to have uh, space and speaking in such kind of forums where we all resonate towards our goal to have a zero waste community. Uh, today, I'll be sharing our story of community engagement to uh, have a better in situ management of wet, wet waste through waste pickers. So, just a first and two slides. We have uh, we, our organization has been uh, has having a goal of transforming the lives for the waste pickers who have once ignored marginalized and informal waste pickers to now owners of India's largest cooperative. This change in their lives have made them uh, travel in their own own ways, and now all the waste pickers, there are around 3,600 waste pickers who are collecting waste from around 9 lakh households and daily recycling around 250 tons of waste for the city of Pune. Uh, considering that because of their intervention and community engagement, we have been successful to have segregation of around 90% uh, around at source. Because of which I can definitely say that through waste pickers, these are the various initiatives that we have started in the city uh, to define them in one one sentence the first one being we collect it is uh, an initiative to collect all the kinds of recyclables and reusables including clothes uh, shoes uh, utensils clothes uh, some kind of uh, toys uh, where we are trying to provide a linkage a channel to for, for, for those who are generating it to the ones there where there is an, a concern of affordability. So that's a great initiative. So we have a small shopping mall for the reusables which we run in the city. The next is uh, it's in Marathi, it is written as Nirmalya to Nisarga, giving back to nature. So we as an Indians have uh, a Ganesh festival where there is a lot of uh, flowers and garlands which have been uh, generated for a particular 10 days of the year. And so through waste pickers, these garlands and uh, flowers are converted into uh, essence sticks, agarbattis as we call them. And so that's a great initiative with, which tries to uh, have a good solution for around 300 tons of waste, uh, the flower garland waste, which is generated over 10 days of the year. The next is about the events. Uh, in the city, we try to manage few events and make them zero waste events by uh, having an intervention of waste pickers to collect the kind of material, as well as have a good policy where, to, uh, where we promote to avoid the kind of plastic usage in terms of small bottles and etc. Next is the MLP uh, in multilayer plastic. Uh, we are trying to uh, collect and have recycling of the multilayer plastic where we have achieved around 100 tons of MLP being recycled every month. Uh, another one is Red Dot campaign, which we run with uh, for sanitary waste, where we are trying to generate awareness in the citizens to have a better handling of sanitary waste, which will avoid the repercussions in the long run on the health and uh, the, the hygiene of the society. Swatch composting, which I'll highlight further in the, in the, in the next part of this PPT, and there is waste trail. So, uh, we urge people and we take people to a waste trail where we show them what happens to the waste they throw. So for example, if you are aware about what happens to the waste you give away, you are more conscious about the waste. By that, this thought, we take many people, students and various cohorts of the citizens 
to waste trails and uh, uh, and we introduce them to the various systems that are running across the city for better management of waste. So this is about the waste-led initiatives that are going on in the city. I'll hit the main point of our discussion. Uh, wet waste management through waste pickers. We try the waste pickers of the city, Pune, uh, Pune City, try to manage the wet waste uh, through two concepts. One is the composting at source, and the other is the biogas technology. So and the, currently we are uh, managing around 120 societies, which is around five tons of uh, wet waste being managed by the waste pickers on the daily, on the daily basis. So this is the picture of pit composting, where every day uh, the waste picker tries to mix the wet waste with the cocoa peat or some kind of mixtures or the compost which is formed earlier, and then have a, uh, the right kind of natural degradation to and facilitating the natural kind of degradation into these composting pits. Uh, this is mostly utilized for the uh, for the societies or the institutions. Uh, the, the next one is what we promote is the, at the individual scale, which is about the home composting. Waste pickers in this segment, what I'm trying to highlight is waste pickers have made themselves adaptive and flexible to learn what are the technologies, what are the products, what are the kinds of methods to uh, convert wet waste into compost, because of which they are trying to manage every kind of technology, every kind of product, and they themselves have become smart enough and are and a, what do I say, sector expert enough to understand which uh, product will work or which service will work and which will not work in the long run. And that's how we are trying to tap more and more societies or individuals to uh, and promoting them to have uh, wet, wet waste to be managed uh, at, the, at the source itself. Uh, the next thing, uh, how do they function? So waste pickers are uh, responsible uh, for the complete cycle of this management. So for example, they themselves go and collect the waste. So they are also responsible for the kind of segregation or promoting the citizens to segregate the waste. And then they uh, have this kind of layering system, which they do for pit composting, the care and the supervision part of it, and then the enriched nutrients. So these kind of modules which run are for the uh, annual contracts or the or the they, they take care of the complete cycle. Currently, what we observe is while managing the wet waste, there are two kinds of concerns. One is the ease of operations and the cost of it. So if waste picker is handling and or taking the ownership of the complete cycle of the wet waste, then people are happy to uh, take, be in this partnership where the one partner is ready to ready to participate as a, and committing to the segregation as a generator and another partner as a waste picker who is trying to uh, committing to uh, manage the wet waste at, at the in situ in a very scientific and a natural way, just uh, which will not produce any kind of complications uh, further. This is a kind of process which uh, waste pickers follow at source. So collection to that the segregation and then mixing off with the cocoa peat and then having a compost. This cycle has a, a period of around three months. So because we also uh, because this is a cycle of three months, we try to utilize the cocoa peat for the first four months for the as a mixture for the uh, for preparing the compost. But henceforth, we try to utilize the compost which is harvested as a mixture material due to which the operation cost of those particular societies goes on reducing. And that's again, one of the uh, contributors of willingness. That's, that's kind of nudge, which people, uh, which people get when we say that the operations costs are going to reduce over the years, rather than the operation cost increasing uh, when we see some kind of mechanized solutions for composting. Uh, another solution which the, or the adaptive adaptability that voice speakers have shown, shown is about the biogas. This is the, uh, the, they are doing biogas and partnering with the technology partner called Vayu. Vayu in Hindi means wind. So uh, it's not waste, it's let's generate something and generate energy out of it is the logo of our, uh, is, the, is, the, uh, is the tagline of our partner. And there are two kinds of units that we uh, have generated. Uh, the, 2 kg capacity, which is for an individual family, and a 10 kg capacity is for a small building considering of 10 households. So if we have a 100, 100 kgs, then we have this uh, uh, unit as a modular one into 10, cap uh, we, do, we multiply it with the capacity required for that particular society. This solution have just converted 
waste man, uh, wet waste managers as waste pickers to the energy providing waste pickers. Uh, that's a good jump for them. And that's why they have in, uh, increased the livelihood options and also learned new technologies to process further. This is the kinds of, uh, kinds of methods waste pickers use to have a better composting. So for example, the first one shows the, the biogas the, the second is just an OWC, which the, uh, the person is trying to figure out. This is the mesh kind of composting, and this is the shredder-based composting. Uh, next is, this is the stack composting, and this is, again, the biogas of capacity around 130, 130 kgs. This is a better picture to show as an outcome, because this is the garden, which is uh, the terrace gardening has been a kind of trending in the city uh, over the past years wherever we promote biogas the slurry from the biogas is as all of you know is very uh, nutrients high and so we kind of promote the terrace gardening wherever there is biogas so this is the outcome of uh, such kind of initiatives and uh, going to the last slide where i just want to highlight the challenges in the work areas which we are trying to uh, take ahead our challenges are very human centric because it's more about awareness in the citizens, lack of willingness to invest, either it can be money or it can be space, and also the bad experience of the people with the wet waste management solutions. So mostly in India, what has happened is the technology heavy solutions have somewhat uh, uh, disgraced this waste management and the, and, the, and the issues with the foul smell, the issues with the niche have been the more facade of this uh, solutions, which we are trying to negotiate with and trying to give a proper solution. So as our uh, one of the speakers said, that if you provide good options, people will take it. That's what we're trying to work out with. Uh, work areas is, uh, is like we're trying to create knowledge base to have easy access, then policy level interventions uh, to promote in situ management, validating market options and customized solutions for generators. I just read them because overall it is a combined package where we are trying to work with the urban local body, that's the Pune Municipal Corporation, and a few other stakeholders. So if unless and until we create a platform where there is resonance about one idea of to become a zero waste community, it will be difficult to have smaller steps uh, in the uh, to create a big picture. So that's what we believe in. Together, we can make wonders with the wet waste. Uh, I think that's my short presentation and uh, questions to follow, I think. Thank Thanks you, Alok. Thank you. That, that was great. And um, I love that your presentation really shows the benefits and the importance of working with waste pickers. Waste pickers are driving these interventions. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some questions on, on how you, you, you got that right. Um, and I also love that all the presentations are showing us how low tech solutions work. Um, Anna, as well, you know, with your non motorized transport. A lock as well, focusing on, on low tech, low cost solutions, which are much easier to replicate in contexts such as ours. And I think it was interesting a lot that you said that the, the higher tech solutions have actually got a, a bit of a given a bad rep to waste management. So yes, it's yeah. interesting, yeah, that um, that you 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 piloting and, and you pushing forward with low tech solutions. So that interests me as well. So thank you so much for that presentation. I think we can um, open for, for questions and we've got a nice um, bit of time at the end. I saw some in the chat, so I'm just gonna scroll up. I think Fatima, you had a couple of very good questions. Um, I wonder if, oh, it's Parama, sorry. Um, Parama, would you like to unmute and, and perhaps ask, ask your questions? I'm not, can attendees do that? That's what maybe, maybe not. Yes, they can. Oh, they can, lovely, thank you. Parama, would you Hello. like to? Hello. Hello, how are you? Thank you very much for the presentations. Actually, I didn't understand very well if um, for this, the first two presentations, if municipality were involved financially and uh, if um, the, um, the facilities were independent uh, and they could pay by their cell, they could pay the salaries. And also for Anna, uh, I was wondering how uh, she managed to convince the um, the, the the households to do the segregation uh, it, it, do they just do it because they want or do they have a financial benefit or something yeah, yeah. thank you very much 
Lovely questions. I think very important. And I was also interested in others. I mean, do you have a good option? Yes, people will take it. But are there any other incentives or maybe penalties for not behaving in a certain way? So I think we are all interested in how we get people to change their behaviors. Let me just see if we've maybe got um, another couple of questions. Um, and so Victor, Tam? Yeah? Yeah, maybe Victor's question is related yes, around the financial yes. model. The financial model. Victor, do you want to just quickly unmute and just expand a little bit on your question to Alok and Anna, and then we can get some responses from you and we can ask another round of questions. For me to, to ask the questions for Anna and Alok? Yeah, you put a okay. question in the chat there that I think is linked to these yes. questions. Yeah, the question for Anna and Alok is, is how the waste pickers are paid for the organic waste recycling? Like, are they paid by the collection and treatment or only the, the products, compost, like soldier flies, uh, methane, uh, are they enough to, to make the project viable? Yeah, thanks. So I think there is some commonality in those, in those questions. So um, I don't mind which speaker wants to have a stab at it first. Um, maybe a local, a lot yeah. you've unmuted. Thank yeah. you. Hi, Victor. So, uh, in the, the in this anarchy, uh, waste pickers have been paid there by citizens directly. Even for the daily waste collection, there has been legislative uh, legislative uh, declaration that every household should pay a seventy five rupees per month to a waste picker for collection of waste, and that's how the city runs on a user fee based model for waste collection at a primary source. Adding to that, the, 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 the charges for the composting part is based on the entrepreneurial skill of the waste pickers. What we facilitate is the minimum baseline. So for example, if a society is more than uh, 300 households and considering the time required for that kind of uh, quantity of waste, to, uh, to manage into the pit composting or biogas is what is considered as a parameter while fixing the kind of uh, the remuneration for the waste picker. So it comes up to around additional 40 to 50 rupees per household other than the primary waste collection user fee, which is around 75 rupees per household. So that, that makes it viable for individual waste pickers. Mm. And it's cheaper for the households. Yes. Yeah. No, lovely. That makes sense. Anna? How do you do it? <laughs> so in the case of Dar es Salaam, um, we are talking about low-income neighborhoods that mostly don't actually have access to a um, collection. And so when you go to, this, to these neighborhoods, we are basically bringing um, a, a solution to them that they are not um that they haven't had an opportunity to use before can you guys hear me you froze mm, to me mm. so i just wanted to make sure that we can hear you anna yes can you hear me we okay. can hear you okay great um and so basically um the way that it goes is that the households use it to pay someone to come to their um, houses once a week more or less and go dump um, the waste in the river, in the nearby river or in the forest, somewhere in a dump site, an illegal dump site in the community because they didn't really have uh, waste collection. And so what we are doing is that people will pay the same amount of money that they were paying for that, but they pay that to the cooperative. Um, we were able to actually register the first waste cooperative in Tanzania, opening the path for more waste cooperatives to be registered. Um, and the way that income is generated is by selling all the recyclables, selling all the byproducts that includes organic farming, black soldier flies, compost, and so all of that, and together with the, the, the household um, contributions. Um, depending on where we are, so for example, as I said, where we, in some of the communities, there was no waste collector. Um, we are now actually implementing this in partnership with a commercial waste collector in another community to see how we can make the financial model work on that. So we can basically reduce the cost of the waste um, collector and then put that, that production tower as the waste cooperative and work in partnership. 
So that's something that we have been exploring now. Um, and in terms of how do we get people to do it? Honestly, I think that it comes from the fact that they have some, they have a face, you know, they have someone that goes every day to their house to collect the waste. It's not a big truck. Um, it's someone, <clears throat> sorry, it's someone pushing a handcart and that go there, goes there and teach them how to do it on a daily basis. <coughs> sorry. And we only collect segregated waste. So in order for the waste to be collected, they need to segregate it. Um, so if it's not segregated, they say, okay, we are coming back tomorrow. And we give people a second. Thanks, Anna. No, thanks, Shema. Sorry that you... I'm sorry for the coffee. <laughs> Okay, no, thank you. Okay, I'm going to quickly go to Victor to give you a chance to just drink a sip of water. Um, Victor, so the question um, was around the partnership with the municipality. What's their role in your project? Well, the, this project that I have presented, the three are basically led by the municipality and financed by the municipality. But we have, uh, I would say that we have two different uh, types of municipality funding for this. Basically, the Green Coin project from Santiago that I said, uh, as the municipality expands too much money on waste management, especially in transportation, because the landfill is so far from their city, that developing a composting plant that works in a really smaller scale than the land of few works, it's cheaper. So the municipality actually saved money from transportation every year when they developed this green coin project. So they were able to pay for the municip for the citizens to separate waste and also give the farmers compost and it and it worked like uh, the municipality saved money compared to the baseline operation landfilling. There is this kind of municipalities here that we have in Brazil as a continental country, like India, that it's so big, the traveling costs uh, are, are quite high. So these municipalities, they finance the, the composting plant, the collection, but mostly in the, the more wealthy cities because the other ones, they rely in dumps. So we have around 3000 dumps in Brazil still. So yet, so these municipalities don't fund the composting because they have a, quite low cost as with the dump that do not compare with composting. Even that composting is normally the cheapest solution compared to filling the filling and other solutions. And, but in Paulo and Florianopolis, compostingly normally is like 20, 30% more expensive than a land fuel operation per ton. But, what a landfill operation, a good landfill operation. If you compare to a dump, the dump is cheaper. So it's more difficult to change from the dump to composting because of the, comp the cost operations. And these municipalities, Florianopolis and Sao Paulo, they pay a bit more to the waste management uh, company that it's contracted, it's privatized in the concession process to compost. So they have a saving from the landfill, but the cost that they reduce by transportation equals the cost that they pay for composting normally. So they invest the same or a bit more in this kind of composting systems. And the other ones that some pictures that I, I showed, that are the larger scales, especially windrow aerated static bio, they are private composting units and they work basically with private waste from industries, from supermarkets that some cities in Brazil, 
they do not collect the private waste. They need to get rid by themselves. They need to contract a private company to, co to collect, to transport. It doesn't come from the public sector that's financed by citizens' taxes. So they are private. So these larger ones, they contracted the composting unit by themselves. So it's mm. completely private in the process. Yeah, no, fa fascinating, Victor, because at the moment with our, our waste project, we, we're also looking at financial models so that we can make a case to the city. And I'm glad to hear because landfilling is um, one of the cheaper disposal methods that you're finding that your um, composting um, innovations are actually turning out to be cheaper. And I'm, I, I definitely will touch base with you privately more to learn about the, um, the green coin and just to see how those sort of innovative financial mechanisms you're innovating at that level as well and i think that's quite important and and the the city officials are always going to listen to the economic um argument so um yeah that's that's really interesting so kira i saw your hand and i think there was a, a, another hand um earlier but has it gone down or is it uh, yes it was keith but he seems to have he either off. jumped off or dropped off yeah Okay, Kira, I'll take I'll take your question, and then I see um, Abdallah has answered asked a, a couple of technical questions in the chat, so maybe um, they can speak after you. Thanks. Yes, and there's also one from DC and Belinda oh, too, right. oh, but I think okay. mine is a bit similar to Belinda's. I'll turn on my video, and everyone else can feel free to do that too when they ask their questions. I'm um, I'm interested to know, um, just from your own experiences, whether um, sort of how you started the engagement with your municipalities. So whether it was first to provide a sort of example of a financial saving or whether legislation, because I think, uh, Victor, you mentioned legislation and a lot sort of due in the sense of saying that, you know, there's, there's been a sort of law passed that you have to pay a waste picker for collection. So, uh, of course, both things would be the best case scenario. But I'm just interested to know what helped. Was legislation first, and then you could come in with a financial model, or financial model first in your cases, which could then help push for some legislation? Thanks, Kira. Brilliant question. Maybe I'm going to jump, if you don't mind, on DC to Belinda's question because it's um, closely related. Belinda, do you, do you mind unmuting and, and posing your question? Welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's been it's been really good to see that there are simple solutions we can easily apply. Um, my question has arisen out of previous experience trying to deal with our own municipality, and that's presenting the cost of savings to landfill. Um, you know, because it's interdepartmental. Um, Etiquini Municipality and City Solid Waste operate as two separate entities. So the, the cost savings that you can show to one entity versus the other entity that's actually hearing your case is not seen as real money, it's seen as funny money. Um, so if we could maybe, Victor, I don't know if you have a model in place that we could use to try and Put, plug in some of our figures that we have, because the other issue that we have is we don't have real costs that come out of city solid waste to tell us what the costs to landfill actually are. Um, so yeah, we have a case to make. Uh, we just need some help in getting it to be convincing. Thanks. I think let's pause and get some responses on this topic. And then um, on DC's question and um, Abdallah's we, we can cover next. Um, anyone want to have a go at, at this first? Victor, can I call on you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, about the question about the, the, the law and that stuff, uh, most of the, the projects here started before law. Like Sao Paulo doesn't have a law for composting. Actually, he has a law for tree pruning, and the tree pruning waste is not addressed so good as the street first. So what we see here in, in Brazil, the, the process that we see most municipalities here, it's the law institutionalizes something that already happens and wants to become larger and to establish. 
the law doesn't work if it comes before this movement. So we have a lot of laws. We have still, we also have like an expression here that Brazil that the laws that catch and laws that doesn't catch. Like we have a lot of laws produced that the like the the society doesn't agree, so they pass the laws and everyone doesn't agree, so the society keeps in the law. And the most uh, funny is that the law continues, but everyone doesn't care about that, so that everyone feels <laughs> like... So laws that work here, like in Florianopolis, the ban on organic waste landfilling. Sao Paulo, you are striving to pass a ban of organic waste landfilling and incineration. They normally comes after this successful projects that uh, that uh, works. So the law didn't come before this these experiences. It's a point. Uh, like big laws, not like uh, laws to support some projects that are pilot. And about the question and uh, yeah, about it's, the, it's kind of like um, in our situation, Belinda is also from Durban, Etiquini, so she's helping also think through these financial models, Victor, but we, we've got a problem where um, there's different departments where we're not sure of municipal costs, so when we're trying to develop these models, there's a lot of gaps and, and, and complications, so I'm not sure if you could maybe compare to your, um, your experience or if you've got um, any thoughts on, on how we can go about this. Yeah, the, the, this cost, these models, it's quite complicated to transport from country to country, like not only for from country to country, because like Brazil, we have uh, like five, six different costs around the regions, because it depends of cost of equipment or labor, diesel costs, truck costs, uh the also land costs like in sao paulo land is quite expensive so the cost of composting goes up and in the countryside basically land doesn't cost anything the municipalities have land to to give for everyone so it's complicated i'll share in the chat uh i study from the the european the european agency i guess they have an economic analysis of options to manage in biodegradable waste so there they develop a model of how do you how do you compare the the, the organic waste management systems but basically the biggest costs of the landfilling operation the direct cost is because normally the municipality doesn't doesn't take into account externalities like methane emissions, health mm. costs. Mm. Being sincere, it, you can put in the in the pencil, right? But uh, they don't normally pay for it. So normally the landfill costs are like uh, the front loader operation, their capital costs. Diesel normally is the most, uh, the, some, the biggest contribution of the operation of waste management because it's quite really cost uh, expensive and you expend a lot in the process to transport and to operate the landfill. You have the leachate treatment of the landfill, the biogas collection costs and operation if you have this, because like in Brazil, most of them don't have this. So you have all the, mm. the labor involved, like you have 10 people working, what are their salaries and social costs? Normally these are the costs of landfilling and the cost of transportation, basically it's the same, like the people working, the diesel and the depreciation of the truck, the buying of the truck. So basically these are the main contributions. What we have here in Brazil, like the, the landfills cost something around $20 because real <laughs> it was never so cheap compared to dollar <laughs> before, but uh, like uh, the, it costs like $20, $20 per ton and composting costs around $25 per ton. 
when you compare the units. So it's not so different in the operation and not comparing the transportation. Transportation depends a lot. Something else. I'll yeah, send but... the link here in the chat. Thanks, Victor. That would be much appreciated. And as you were listing in those different costs, I was jotting down a few that we have, haven't actually um, fully costed in yet that we still need to add. So thank you. And thank you for that resource. Um, Alok, do you have any any thoughts or any um, comments yeah. on financial models, involvement of city officials? Um, yeah. Yes. So uh, basically what worked for us was, uh, was a pilot which we ran around in 2007. So our story is long back when we started. So there's also a question about how we, what was the starting point for Swatch? So our starting point was 2007-8 when we had done a pilot with the ULB, uh, which was just, what do I say? They agreed to have a pilot and where they supported the pilot at a scale. And uh, for those two years, we tried convincing citizens about how, do, uh, how is it good that to have a user fee-based model and and that that's what worked for us so if you see the trend line so in 2000 uh, 2007 8 when we started we were just the waste pickers and the community engagement was around 300 or 500 waste pickers who started with such kind of pilot and the starting point was hope to change so basically they they brought it that hope at the community level engagement around few 10 or 12 percent of the citizens kind of engaged into it this user fee based model then in the law to formalize this. So the Swatch Cooperative has been formed by Kagat Kats Katsara Kashtakari Panchayat, which is a trade union of base pickers and um, Pune Municipal Corporation. So actually they're participating in a formation of a cooperative in our case. So that's what they're buying is. And from there till 2014-16, the first five years of the, uh, of, the, of the organization went towards convincing the citizens about the USP of the model, where it is the, about the financial model. So if we, uh, it's easy to give away 60 rupees or 40 rupees to start with to a waste pickers, rather than having a cost, which is uh, $20 for us, it will be around 1700 rupees per ton. So, which was a huge cost for a city. So currently what we portray and how we discuss with the ULB, it's like, if we have uh, this model running, it will cost you something X and if we have the transportation based model running, it will be something around 100 X. So the huge difference is such that nobody can challenge uh, in terms of the, the, what do I say, the workability of this model. There can be small uh, improvisations to the model as we grow. So there can be initiatives that can be added. There can be add-on services that needs to be provided by the waste pickers or then can be adaptive systems. So, Few that has to be used, waste pickers have to use electric vehicles, waste pickers have to use some other kind of tools to collect waste. Such adaptiveness is what model can have. But if we change the model completely to a transportation based thing, then the cost is 100x and city will is not in a position to bear that. So, so that's, that's how we try to communicate. So for us, it was a pilot, then law, then enforcement, and it took off. So in 2016, if we were working with around 1,500 base speakers, collecting around 3 lakh households, in 2021, we are 3,600 base speakers collecting from around 9 lakh households. So that's a good amount of growth in five years. It's, it's, it's a combination of law and enforcement. That's, that's my answer to this. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I think how could the city turn away that, um, that model as well when it's including so many waste pickers contributing to their, their livelihoods, whereas an alternative system that didn't involve them, those are people that yeah, wouldn't yeah, um, have yeah. those opportunities and that contribution to their to their, um, their income. So thank you, Alok. Okay, we've got 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly take the last round of questions and then get the three speakers just to see if they can comment and conclude. So um, Keith, I saw you had a hand earlier, you, you dropped off. Would you like to come in and ask your question? And then we'll go Kira, Abdullah and Mondisi. Hi, yes, um, thank you very much. Um, hi everybody, uh, great presentations. I certainly love the um, utilization of voice speakers and the low tech, low cost um, approaches. Um, 
to my friend, uh, Anna, uh, with regards to the maggot farming, um, is that possible to, can one undertaken, can that be undertaken at a, um, at the, at the household level? Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is to Victor. Uh, Victor, with regards to the compostable bags, um, are those bags uh, provided uh, free of charge to the households and and users? Um, all right, thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. Some lovely practical questions that were linked to some of the others in the chat, Kira. No, sorry, Tim, just um, ignore mine. I was trying to find my clapping hands when I was impressed with what people <laughs> were saying. But for some reason, they, you can't do that here. Okay, so well, we can hear you, Clap. No, um, no, so I'm excited, thank thanks. Thank you. Abdallah, you had some technical questions as well. Would you like to uh, unmute and, and, and share your questions? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I hope you hear me, right? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, first of all, thank you all our presenters. Uh, it was a, did a fruitful discussion and the presentation. Uh, Victor, my director, Anna, um, and Alok, yeah, you did it. Yeah, quickly to the question uh, to Mr. Victor. Uh, based on the major principle uh, of uh, biological composting at the same regardless of uh, scale, technology, and the feedstock, but we have seen uh, on static composting, you put cover on top of the pile, while others, they don't, uh, it's not, it's uncovered. So the basic idea of covering from the top, is it uh, to stop maybe uh, sunlight or rain or whatever, maybe we need an answer. Uh, maybe you can learn more about that. And the, Mr. Alok, uh, I think you are working with the community and we have seen some of your composting uh, uh, systems uh, located nearby households and the neighborhoods. Maybe how do you uh, tackle the challenge of odor? Maybe for the nearby uh, neighborhoods, is there any, no challenge about odor or what? Oh, no, the oh. challenge, yeah. No, yeah. let's. I'm um, sorry. Just let oh. me finish. There's one more colleague sure. of ours who had a question. On DC, would you like to unmute and ask the the last question to the panelists? DC. Let's give him a second. Otherwise, I can read his question. Let me just scroll up here. Yes, and also Tam, I think to some extent yes. um it's yes. been answered a little bit. It's probably been yeah. answered, yeah. So so um this question was for you, Alok, and, uh, and it may have already been discussed. Um, he just wanted to know more about the participation and the buy-in from community members when they're working with waste pickers that are coming to the homes to collect the to collect the waste. Okay, so that's that's great. So um Anna, shall we start with with you? Um, black soldier fly, can it be done at the household level? Yeah. yeah, so black soldier flies can be done at the household level. I actually had it at my household. Um, as I said, they actually come to you in climates like the climates of Tanzania. Like if you put the bean outside and there is a specially designed bean that has a hole where they enter and everything, and they kind of come to you on their own. You don't really need to look for them. They find you. Um, so it can be done at the household level, yes, um, but it does require you, you need to know what, like the separation needs to be well done. You need to make sure that if you put the, the proper um, waste, like the proper kinds of waste for them there, otherwise you end up having quite a bit of a smell. And so you also need to, if it be your household, if you have like an open area outside like mine that I had a garden, so then you put that in the garden, then it's fine. But if it's a small household and you're planning to keep it close to the kitchen or something, that becomes a little bit tricky um, because you need to manage it really well to prevent the smell. Uh, but it can, and there are there is there are especially composted beans that you can you can use for that, and you can also adapt some beans um, to use for that. Thanks, Anna. 
Okay, so um, Victor, can we move to you about the compostable bags? Are they provided free of charge? And this project of Florianopolis in Brazil, uh, they were provided with no costs to these condominiums that wanted to get in the pilot project, but they receive like a, just a, some initial compostable bags. After that, they needed to buy these compostable bags and most of them didn't buy because it's too costly here. Like the compostable bags here in Brazil, they cost something around 20 to 50 times more than the normal bags. They are too expensive. And these ones are even Brazilian made from, from cassava, cassava manioc. Uh, corn and they didn't provide anymore just to the beginning so they are doing it uh, without the bags just in the container and then they wash the containers after after the collection it's more more cheap so they did the, the municipality doesn't provide but we have cities around the world that the municipality the citizens needed to buy the compostable bags and the data that we have is that it increases a lot the, the, the engagement because it's cleaner, people like more, like in San Francisco, in the United States, they buy, and Milan, in Italy, they buy, and it increases a lot the, the, the process. And it's a way to, to charge the citizens. You buy the, the bags, mm. it's the waste fee buying the bags, something like that. But here in Brazil, it doesn't work a lot. So, and uh, the cover question about the static mm. pile, it's, a, it's an important and interesting question. Most of the composting units that we have here in Brazil, they don't use this cover because it's a bit expensive and uh, but some of them use because depending on the waste characteristics it's quite a uh, odor uh, they have uh, too much odor so they cover with this and the the thing that this the systems works it works it's like viable around uh, 20 tons per day most of the the companies that they use it is here because they have some some better better benefits than the the biofuture the biofuture from straw from grass and other stuff it decomposes with the time and the composting process and sometimes when you collect the compost it get mixed in the compost so it's a problem of the biofuture sometimes the other problem is the biofuture it uh, it let the rain get in and most of the places here in brazil it rains a lot as most tropical countries so you cannot control the moisture in the static pile system and mo and and in static pile composting method controlling moisture it's a key point in the process as you don't have turning to control the the moisture if the moisture gets too low you don't have porosity to operate so they put these covers and also this cover, they have a, a process that they let uh, carbon dioxide getting out and you pump the oxygen, but they don't let uh, any other, any molecule that it's not the carbon dioxide getting out of this membrane. So it's odorless and the composting plant doesn't, can can like locate besides a neighborhood. So you have composting plants with discover besides schools, beside the industries and other places, streets, commercial areas, because discover doesn't let the other get out. What in the bio future, you have some moments that it cannot uh, uh, protect the process and you don't need it to construct a roof that's quite expensive, but the cover is also quite expensive. So the places that use this cover here in Brazil are normally private, uh, 
and they process 2000 tons per day or more and they receive a lot of animal protein like and they receive it like a lot of of meat ham and waste from restaurants and from other places that work with meat so they use this cover to have a higher a higher control of the process no thanks thank you so much victor that's that's really useful and uh, look uh, just quickly on the subject of odor, we had a question about how you manage um, odor in your project. And then um, I think the other question has probably been um, sufficiently answered, but if you have a last thought, you're welcome to share it. Thanks. So about the odor part, when I speak of in-situ wet waste management, I speak of quantities of around 500, maximum of 500 to 700 kgs of a pit composting or caged composting. And in that, what we have observed or experienced is that when we have right kind of mixtures to be added in the daily wet waste, then order is not there. So for example, if we use cocoa peat, which is the shredded coconut shell. So if that is rightly mixed with the, uh, with the wet waste on a daily terms, so we need to decompose that waste and not decay that waste. If we decay, leave it to decay, then there is a smell. If we have a facilitate the decomposition process, it doesn't smell. That's 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 simple. And so uh, when I said that the waste picker takes ownership of the complete cycle, I meant that every day waste picker will come, will lay a uh, that wet waste on a on a sheet of on a plastic sheet, then mix it with kind of mixtures, and then put it into that composting peat. We are not getting into that cycle of uh, whatever we collect as wet waste. We dump it in the composting peat, and then say there's order, and then add chemicals to reduce that order. It's better to manage it at the first step itself. And so we have experienced that currently at 120 societies. We don't see this as an issue, and people are very happy with the service kind of thing. Wonderful. That's fascinating. And I like that play on decay versus decompose. So yeah, that's that's really useful. No, yeah. thank you so much, speakers. Um, it was wonderful listening to you today and, and we learned so much. And I can see from the debate and the questions asked that everyone was really engaged. Um, so thank you so much. And we will um, email you all the invite for the second session. Um, so please have a fantastic afternoon. And we'll share the recording as well for those that, that want it. Um, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank it was thank really, you. really thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.